at some point I have to let that Speaking of sugar, is there is there a hierarchy of sugars that are less toxic, damaging, both short and long term, or is it all universally bad? So if it's honey versus agave versus coconut sugar versus brown sugar, then refined sugar, is there? How do you view that? Is it all stay away, or or need to find? I think we can there? probably not get away from having no sugar, sure. but it's the quantity. And again, it's the setting in which these types of foods are taken in. So I, I recently saw a study that I thought was really fascinating. It was a meal that was exactly the mirror of itself, a salad with a chicken breast and a biscuit. If the group ate the chicken breast and the, and the biscuit first and the salad last, the sugar impact when they looked at the blood and check the sugar levels was much higher than if you reversed it and you ate the salad first and the chicken and the biscuit meal. So it's really interesting because of the way that the food combined and even the order in which you eat food and you wonder like a lot, like the tradition is to start a meal with a salad. But there's a reason for that because the fiber in the salad is going to slow down the rate at which any sugar in the food is going to get into the bloodstream. But the other problem we don't talk about is, is fruit sugar, fructose, but also fructose that gets into our drinks, like high fructose corn syrup. And that's that's a huge problem because it becomes fuel for diabetes. There's only one organ in the body that can process fructose, which is fruit sugar, whereas every single cell in the body can use cane sugar or, or carbohydrate sugar. But fructose can only be used by the liver. And if the liver gets overwhelmed with fructose, which is what has happened and been the trend in the US, and now I think worldwide over the last several decades, it causes insulin resistance, which then leads to weight gain, leads to increased fat in the middle, and it becomes this self-feeding process. So if you overwhelm your body with orange juice, fruit juice, my, my sister always tells her kids to drink orange juice, <laughs> and, when, and I have not convinced her yet that that's actually not good for your immune system. <laughs> but, but we grew up with thinking like, orange juice is good for you. If you're getting sick, like drink, drink some orange juice. And I, I haven't had orange juice in I don't know how long. But you have to be careful with overwhelming your body with fruit sugar, because it, even though you think it's good, too much of it could actually be bad. And we were really meant to only eat fruit seasonally. We weren't meant to be eating fruit year round, and certainly not drinking fruit juice, which is removed from the way that nature made it, which is in a fruit that has fiber, has other uh, nutrients that help slow down the way that the, the fruit sugar gets into the body. Yeah, I was just going to say, if any of you have opinions on kind of juicing, I know because people when they're getting sick think maybe I should go and drink a lot of like green juice, whatever, you know, eating the fruit whole versus juicing it. I think if you're gonna have a juice, you wanna have a green juice, a non-sweet juice. So made from celery and cucumber and those kinds of Lemon. things. Lemon, ginger, ginger. Uh, parsley, you can put fresh herbs in there. So if you're gonna have a juice, I'd say go that way. Um, in terms of fruits and fruit juice, totally agree. It's much better to eat the entire fruit that has all the fiber intact, which is gonna blunt that blood sugar spike, than a, a glass of juice. Um, so yes, you don't really want to eat or to be drink fruit juice, especially not regularly. But if you are going to, there is a little hack. You can, if you put a tablespoon of uh, chia seeds in your fruit juice, it will suspend through the liquid. You won't taste it at all, but at least you'll have some of that protein and that fat that will slow down the spike to some extent. Okay, so the question is about the flu shot. So you want to go a little controversial. I know, um, I really, and I don't want it. I really don't. Like, it's not well, let me give you information that can... I'm not going to tell you what to do or, or what viewpoint to have, but let me give you information about it. So the, the flu shot, ever since the 80s, there has been a push from the government and the CDC to get more Americans vaccinated against the flu. So flu vaccine rates have gone up since the 80s, late 70s, 80s, to the present. Percent of the population. The percent of people that get the flu on a yearly basis has not changed. It's been the same percentage of the population. 
the percent of people who end up in the hospital with complications from the flu has not changed. So in spite of the fact that we have vaccinated more people against the flu, we have not changed baseline flu rates in the population because there's more things that go into the flu than just the flu shot. And the flu shot is being manufactured based on whatever are the, the two influenza A and the two influenza B strains that are circulating in Asia, usually in China, maybe in Southeast Asia, in the spring. So they're trying to predict which flu viruses are gonna make their way across the globe and hit us in the fall. So they don't get it right all the time. So the effectiveness of the flu shot is anywhere between 35% to maybe 70%, somewhere in an average of 50%. So it's a coin toss. And probably the difference is dependent on the person's own foundation. So we go back to everything that we've been talking about, about building your immune foundation, and vitamin D, the elderberry. So you're asking what can you do afterwards? I mean, I hear that, not everyone gets that type of response, and it probably depends on after a flu shot, if, they, if you feel sick, it probably has to do with what's going on with their immune system and how hyper alert it is. I've seen complications from these vaccines. People develop uh, all sorts of uh, sometimes neurological issues, uh, inflammatory autoimmune issues. Uh, so it's not for everyone. And personally, for my own patients, depending on the patient, I mean, sometimes patients want to get a flu shot and, and I recommend then a preservative free one. Uh, but if there's any sort of autoimmune disease, any sort of foundation of immune disruption, then I don't always recommend it uh, because I think that it can come in and kind of throw the immune system out of whack. So maybe you can tell them you have an egg allergy. I know, I did. I tried like that because there's an eggless vaccine. Yeah. So they, they, kind of, they get you, but I work for a hospital, that's why I get I mean, when the swine flu pandemic came out, I thought that that was really ridiculous. So I, I really looked into the, the flu and what was going on there. And one theory why the 1918 pandemic was so deadly is because the people who had this fulminate pneumonia and died uh, had severe vitamin D deficiency. And they found that if your vitamin D levels are high enough, you're not gonna suffer the severe consequences from the flu. And I'll just add that I did a lot of research on this too and was a little concerned about what I saw with preservatives and vaccines in general, not just the flu. When Dr. Pedre said ask for preservative free, that is really hard to do. You're usually coming in there and you know they're already ready to give you a shot and you have to send it back and they're gonna go check and it's big to do, but it's really worth it to explain and sort of stand up for yourself and say that you have concerns about preservatives and you know to really push for a preservative free one because I'm sure they'll sort of be like, oh no, this one's, you know, it's okay, it's okay, but it's worth standing up for. Uh, one part was a question about nightshades and are they bad for us or why are they bad for us? And then the second question was about food sensitivity testing or food allergy testing and are these tests accurate? So that's, that's a little bit controversial because there's, you know, when we talk about, I'm gonna to go to the food uh, testing first, uh, we think it's just one thing, but it's actually multiple different things depending on what the lab is using and what type of test they're using. So it could be an IgG, it could be an ELISA. Uh, some labs use what we call IgG with complement activation. So they're looking to see if it activates the clotting cascade uh, as a next level to see how significant that IgG is. And honestly, all these tests to me are like Monet paintings. You know Monet? Mm -hmm. how, are his, how are his paintings? Well, but, but you know that you're looking at Big Ben. Or you know that you're looking at water lilies. But are you seeing them in full 3D crystal clear? No. So that's what these tests are. You know, we get stuck with thinking that tests are concrete, that they are black and white. They are just guideposts. They are a light post in the middle, or a lighthouse in the middle of the darkness of you navigating your health. And if you can't find 
what foods you may be reacting to by doing kind of a broad-based elimination diet, which is probably the first place to start uh, because there's no way to test for every single type of reaction that you could possibly have to foods in just one test. So one test may say that gluten is not a problem for you, but when you eat gluten, maybe you have certain types of symptoms that you're wondering, is this a reaction? But now this test told me that I don't react. So what, you, what do you believe? Remember Monet. The test is blurry. The test is not black and white. What is, is your experience. That's really important. Like, and that goes back to being intuitive and really listening to your body because it can be a really subtle signal. So once I figured out that I had a gluten sensitivity, once I started testing gluten again after avoiding it for six months, I immediately got itchy on the inside of my wrist and a very faint red rash. I had never in my life experienced that. And I thought, well, this is strange. So I've never, this has never happened before. And I thought, well, I'm gonna not eat it for a while and I'll test it again in a couple of months. And when I test it again, just being the scientific self that I am, I wanna see that there's replicity in the test result. I got that same itching on the inside of my wrist with like a faint little red rash within minutes of eating gluten. You know, and that to me is verifiable. So you have to pay attention to that. Now the nightshades, it's not clear for everyone. So they have something called beta alkaloids, which at a high concentration can be poisonous. I mean, every plant produces its own pesticides. They produce their natural insect repellents, and some of those can not be not so good for us. Now when you cook the nightshades, you actually reduce the beta alkaloids by like 30%, 30 or 40%. But it's not clear for everyone. The place where we see the connection is with arthritic conditions, so like rheumatoid arthritis. So people who are sensitive to that uh, maybe might benefit from an alkaloid-free diet, like taking those out. Uh, but it's not clear-cut across the board. The only way you can know if you're suspecting that, if you have some sort of inflammatory condition, is to do an experiment and take all of those nightshades out of your diet and then do what you're doing now, taking notes, taking really careful notes because we tend to forget. Take notes about how you feel every day, take notes how you feel not eating the food and then maybe after four weeks or six weeks reintroduce tomatoes or eggplant and log how you feel in the next 24, 48, even 72 hours because the reaction could take that long. So that's how you do it. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not sure if this relates to the previous question about what sugar are better for you, but um, is there a difference between cooking vegetables and not cooking vegetables? I, I like to caramelize a lot of vegetables and roast them for a long roast. Is there any difference between one another? Sure. So, you know, I, th I think in the recent years there's been this whole movement, I, although it's waning, like the raw food movement, and you don't want to overcook your vegetables because you lose all these enzymes and nutrients. But, you know, each vegetable and fruit even is different. And certain, when you're cooking things, you are going to degrade a certain amount of the nutrients, but you may actually raise other nutrients and antioxidants. And so I think that cooking your vegetables and cooking your produce is totally fine because if you think about um, the amount of nutrition and nutrients and the levels of vitamin that are in produce, it's very often like a cup of, I don't know, kale or butternut squash or whatever is off the charts. It's over 100% of your daily value of you know certain nutrients. So even if you degrade it a little bit, say 10, 20, 30%, it's really not that big of a deal. Uh, so I would say it's totally fine to, to cook your, your veggies. I will comment that some people can't digest raw vegetables and have patients with severe gut issues that lack the enzymatic capacity and the bacterial makeup to be able to break down those plant fibers. So cooking the vegetable is like starting the process of digestion outside of your body. So the sicker the patient, the worse the gut issues are, I have them cook the vegetables much longer. And then as they get better, they can start going slowly 
back towards raw. And, and once they are, they're able to tolerate raw, that tells me that we've done a lot of healing of their gut lining. Well, first, I mean, knowing what your food source is, right, uh, and what it was washed with. So it's not, it's not so common to get parasites from vegetables, for example, uh, unless it was contaminated by water that had parasites. Uh, but the question of parasites, I mean, we probably all have to harbor some parasite, and they're very difficult to diagnose. So even the best of studies often miss parasites. But again, a lot of parasites come from animal products, and that's where eating raw might not be the best thing. I mean, even sushi is actually supposed to be, by the FDA, is supposed to be frozen and then thawed before it is served, and the freezing process kills off a lot of parasites. So the question was, with probiotics, do you prefer food-based or supplement-based? So I think if you have, you're in good health and you don't really have any digestive issues or immune issues, then getting your probiotics through food is, is great. And you can get that through things like kimchi and pickles, like traditionally pickled pickles, uh, and traditionally fermented foods. Uh, but if you do have a, a digestive issue or your know, immune system's compromised or anything like that going on, then you I think it's better to supplement because you're going to get more of the probiotics and they're going to probably be more effective than just eating you know, a side of kimchi. I see probiotic makers right there in those vegetables because really what creates our probiotics are prebiotic fibers, non-digestible carbohydrates in the foods we eat. So for, for example, like garlic, asparagus, Jerusalem artichoke, like these have prebiotic fibers like inulin that help build the healthy gut flora. So it's a combination of things. And then depending again, like Maria said, on your, your base, because if you have yeast overgrowth, you might not do so well with fermented foods. You, they might actually make you sicker. And you have to work your way up there. I see a lot of sick patients with uh, major uh, gut imbalances, and I tend to put them on a probiotic supplement. Uh, they can be really helpful, but right there, the vegetables on your plate, those are your, your, your good bacteria makers. They alter, they can alter your gut flora. And you're gonna get more of the good guys if you're eating a mix, that rainbow of vegetables. And if you're eating a paleo diet that's really high in meat, then you're gonna develop a different uh, gut microbiome that possibly is not gonna be as diverse if you're not throwing in that variety of vegetables in there as well. Yes, I have a question. Uh, this has been really interesting. Thank you. I've learned a lot. Question for the panel. What do you eat for breakfast? Bashu, <laughs> I feel like you haven't... No, I, I'm actually much more confused. <laughs> 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 well, give it a go. Sure, sure. So I'm a very... Um, I eat eggs. Uh, I try to have a vegetable, whether it's sweet potato or avocado, um, anything that we cook is usually in, in coconut oil or an unrefined oil like that. Um, uh, when I'm not feeling well, ginger, turmeric, tea with hot lemon as well. Pretty simple, but be much more curious to hear. So I prefer savory breakfast as well. I usually have eggs. Um, I do find that when I have like a smoothie or a smoothie bowl or like too much fruit, then I'm hungrier sooner and just like, it doesn't satisfy me as much. So I'll usually have two eggs, organic, pasture-raised from the farmer's market and a ton of vegetables. So that 50 and sometimes 75% of my plate is whatever sauteed vegetables or whatever vegetables I have on hand, I just saute them with usually like scallions or onions. So I'll throw kale in there, mushrooms, butternut squash, Literally whatever veggies I have, I'll just throw that in the pan and saute that first, put that aside, and then scramble the eggs, and that's my breakfast. I have two kind of main breakfasts. One is coconut oil with a sunny side up egg or two with the egg yolk runny. 
And the reason for the runny egg yolk is because it's rich in choline, but once you cook the egg yolk, you lose those properties. The choline is uh, really important for liver detoxification. My other alternative is a smoothie, which I make with protein powder. I throw in collagen, and every day I will mix it up. So today I, I threw in uh, Swiss chard. Uh, sometimes I add raw cacao in it. I'll put hemp seeds. Uh, I may add nuts to it. So I love the smoothie because I pack in a lot of nutrients in this one drink, and that actually, uh, when I do it the right way with the nut milk, uh, that keeps me full until lunchtime. Uh, you have to mix in the right proportion of fats and protein and fiber. I will add, because eggs were mentioned, that Welby has a great guide video on our site and on Instagram and Facebook on this. And I mention that only because I've learned a lot recently about how much the different terms on the egg carton really impact your health. And some of them don't mean anything, and some of them mean a lot and are really important. So watch our video, but I'll cut to the, the end and say that pasture-raised eggs are definitely the super important. Well, and they're omega-3 rich. And they're omega-3 yeah, rich. So chickens are meant to walk around, and they're actually omnivores. I don't know if you know this, but they eat insects, they eat worms. Uh, they're not supposed to be eating just corn and soy. It's bad. So yeah, so when you see vegetarian, it's actually not a good thing on your egg carton. You guys are giving away our whole video. <laughs> <laughs> Here's more. <laughs>